From Monster to Wonder Woman, director Patty Jenkins has proven across two very different movies that audience investment in a character is crucial to a film's success. Welcome to From Rags to Blockbusters, a series where we examine the ideas and techniques of indie directors who are given the keys to big budget blockbusters. In her 23 year long career as a filmmaker, Jenkins has only ever directed two feature films, Monster in 2003 and Wonder Woman in 2017 with 2020's Wonder Woman 1984 set to be her third. But despite having a 14 year absence in the director's chair, at least in film, Jenkins has maintained a deep understanding of authentic and believable characters, which may explain how, or more importantly why, Warner Brothers gave the reins of an intellectual property as valuable as DC's Wonder Woman to someone with only one indie darling under her belt, while other tentpole franchise films from DC and beyond were dished out to more experienced directors like Zack Snyder, J.J. Abrams or Ron Howard. So what are the similarities between the two films? Wonder Woman, which is about an Amazonian demigoddess who leaves her magical island home to fight and ultimately defeat the god of war during World War I, and Monster, the biopic of Eileen Wernos, America's most iconic female serial killer who murdered at least six men in the late 80s and mid 90s. Well, the obvious constant between the two films is that they both focus on iconic women. And sure, they're both considered powerful and violent vastly different ways, but I think what attracted Jenkins to both projects was the idea of developing characters with agency. Whether that agency shows a character who steps up to the plate to defend the weak, or a character who will kill anyone who attacks her, or whom she convinces herself is going to attack her. If you've seen Monster, you'll know that the film definitely encourages you to sympathise with Wernos, despite her being a murderer, to see her as more of a victim of society than a cold-blooded psychopath. We don't forgive her of her crimes, but we understand her as a character. Because it's not about whether a character commits good acts or evil acts that makes them a powerful character. It's whether or not we, the audience, understand their decisions and motivations. In the case of Wonder Woman, it's a noble motivation, full of sacrifice and heroism. And in the case of Monster, it's a tragic one, full of heartbreak and anger. Motivation is really what it all comes down to. Sympathetic characters, specifically sympathetic villains, are some of the best characters ever put to screen. Remember two or three years ago when everyone was complaining that Marvel never had any good villains outside of Loki? Then they gave us Vulture from Spider-Man Homecoming, Killmonger and Black Panther, and of course Thanos in Avengers Infinity War. All of who were praised by critics, and each was systematically declared as Marvel's best villain to date. This is because Marvel caught on to the problem of having cardboard villain after cardboard villain. They're boring and we don't believe their motivations. Cassilius in Doctor Strange is evil because he wants power. Aldrich Killian in Iron Man 3 was evil because Tony Stark pranked him. Ultron in Avengers Age of Ultron is evil because destroying humanity is the only way to protect it, which really is the pumpkin spice latte of basic artificial intelligent villain plans. Compare these motivations to the complex and tragic backstories of Killmonger or Thanos or Eileen Wernos. When seeing and understanding their points of view, it almost feels out of place to even use the word evil to describe them. Because once we understand a character, we sympathise with them and relate to them whether we agree with them or not. And this creates nuance. This creates a conflicted opinion from audience members. This creates a layered character. And while I don't believe that you need to wipe out half the population of the entire universe, I understand why Thanos believes that. And while I don't believe that you should murder anyone, I understand why Eileen Wernos believes that. And while Diana's motivation in Wonder Woman is a lot more simple and easier for an audience to get behind, she just wants to save the world and stop the war, she's also enhanced by not being a caricature. She's not inexperienced or hopelessly naive, which would have been an easy route to go down considering her fish out of water status after leaving Themyscira for the real world. If you haven't seen it, Pop Culture Detective has a great video essay about the born sexy yesterday trope, which is typical of sci-fi films such as The Fifth Element or Tron Legacy, in which extraterrestrial or foreign naive female characters are portrayed as sexualized love interests for their down-to-earth male lead. 
objects, despite the fact that they were constructed, discovered, or ostensibly born yesterday. It would have been easy to portray Wonder Woman this way against Steve Trevor, have her be the male fantasy of the inexperienced, sexualized female outsider who is constantly in awe of the intellectually superior and well-traveled male. And while Jenkins plays with this idea, ultimately we see that Diana has experience and a fully formed understanding of relationships and sexuality. You know all about that. I mean, I refer to that in, in other things. The pleasures of the flesh. Do you know about that? I've read all 12 volumes of Cleo's treatises on bodily pleasure. All 12, huh? And this makes her and Steve falling in love a lot more realistic and authentic. And on the other side of the coin, this realistic portrayal of sexuality is what makes the more difficult to watch scenes in Monster so impactful and grounded. Mainly because these violent moments are devoid of sexy imagery. I am not showing footage of these scenes. The characters in Jenkins films feel like real people, with strengths and flaws and beliefs. Wonder Woman star Gal Gadot has said of her experience developing the character, For a long time people didn't know how to approach the story. When Patty and I had our creative conversations about the character, we realised that Diana can still be a normal woman. One with very high values, but still a woman. She can be sensitive, she is smart and independent and emotional. She can be confused, she can lose her confidence, she can have confidence, confidence. She is everything. She has a human heart. Whether they're good or evil or somewhere in between, a believable and relatable motivation is what makes a character resonate with audiences. And this is something that Patty Jenkins understands and displays through her characters whether they be in gritty indie films or big budget blockbusters. Realistic characters create a world which resembles the messy nature of our own, where morality isn't black or white, and people behave like people and believe different things. And sure, as with always, there's a more cynical argument that suggests that indie film directors are hired for franchise franchise blockbusters so they can easily be manipulated by producers into making a cookie cutter money maker that fits the mould of their brand and the lengthy pre-production process of Wonder Woman which dates back as far as the mid 90s also indicates that Warner Brothers simply wanted a female voice behind the film and Jenkins having directed one Oscar winning film already as well as several episodes of television simply fit the bill. But look whatever financially attractive decision motivated producers to hire Jenkins for Wonder Woman it was the correct choice whether it was an accident or not. Thanks for watching everybody and let me know which indie director who was thrust into the world of making a big budget blockbuster you'd like to see us cover next. Thank you very much for watching the first and possibly only episode of From Rags to Blockbusters. Uh, this year on Cold Pop Show we're just going to be throwing everything at a wall and seeing what sticks. So in between our podcast videos and standalone video essays we're going to be trying out a few of these series pilot episodes to see if people like them and maybe they will and we'll make more and maybe they won't and we won't make any more so that's where you guys come in let us know what you want to see on cold pop in 2019 very excited about this year and what uh what content we have to bring to you so hope you enjoy it and we'll see you next time